Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Sister Tina. And we'll give the time to Amen. Sister Debbie. Amen. Sister Debbie, you've got up to 12 o'clock or 12 10. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. And happy Sabbath to everyone. Happy Sabbath. Good I am. I am blessed and thankful to God for this privilege to be able to be part of this awesome um, work and for what we have um, been through for two weeks with our theme, the battle is the Lord's. And I hope that we remember that, that it is not our battle, it's the Lord's battle. But what is happening, we would like to join the army and be part of it but the battle is God's. Now to um, just to bounce off from what Sister Ursula um, spoke about, the two horn beasts of Revelation chapter 13, it is this same two horn beast that is going to form the image of the beast. Revelation 17 speaks of a woman riding the scarlet colored beast. Um, Brother Oliver, can you put the picture up for me, please? Revelation 17 speaks about a woman, right? Riding a scarlet color beast. Here she said, you can see her in the distance. She's sitting on the head and on the heads and then on the beast. If you notice something, this woman has a cup in her hand, as you can see. Revelation 17, four says it's a golden cup. That woman is holding a golden cup and Revelation 18 verse three says, and all the nations drank the wine of that cup, of her fornication, of her false doctrines, of her sins, her sins. Hence, we are instructed in 1 Peter 5, 8, and I would like every person to turn to it, 1 Peter 5, verse 8. 1 Peter 5, verse 8, it says, all nations drank from the cup and they are drunk with the wine of her fornication. But what does um, 1 Peter 5, 8 tell us to do? And it says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So here this woman is making all nations drunk and God is telling his children this Sabbath morning, to be sober, that is not to be drunk, and to be vigilant because the adversary, the devil, walk it about as a roaring lion. You see, he is not the lion because Revelation 5 tells us that Jesus Christ is the lion. So he is as a lion, he's mimicking, he's mocking, but he's not the lion. Jesus Christ is the lion and he's walking about Satan seeking whom he may devour. Now, because the woman is holding a cup in her hand, God has given us present truth believers and all Seventh-day Adventists all around the world a, a container as well. She is holding a cup, but God's people know of a container in Zechariah chapter four. Anyone wants to unmute their mic and tell me what that container is? Zechariah chapter four, this woman is holding a cup. What is the container we have in Zechariah chapter four? Anybody wants to stay? It's Sabbath school. Golden bowl. A golden bowl. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are to take ours from a golden bowl. Remember she has a golden cup, but God is offering to us a golden bowl. And what are we to do out of that bowl? Um, somebody find Jeremiah chapter 15, 16, and somebody find Job 23, 12. And quickly, somebody can read before we pray. What are we to do? from our bowl, Jeremiah chapter 15, 16, and what it says. Remember, it's only 40 minutes I have. <laughs> Jeremiah 15, 16, anybody wants to um, read or recite it for us? What Jeremiah 15, 16 says? I'll read, thy words were found and I did eat them and thy word was unto thee Unto me, sorry, the joy and rejoicing of mine heart, 
For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Awesome. So here we see that Jeremiah is, is one of those eating from that bowl. He says, thy words were found and I didn't drink them. I ate them. And it was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. And what does Job say in Job 23, 12? Nobody has it? Job 23, 12? It says, neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. You hear that? Job is saying that he esteems the word of God more than his necessary food, brethren. So both prophets are telling us that the word of God is to be eaten. So this morning, according to Shepherd's Road Pocket Edition, page 87, we are going to feast from the bountiful table of present truth. Let us reverently need for prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God and our Heavenly Father, great is thy faithfulness. You are the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David, our fathers. We come bowing in your presence this morning saying thank you for life and thank you for a sound mind that we can assemble all around the world to praise you on this your holy Sabbath day. We know for some that the sun has set, but I know they still love you so much that they are worshiping and they are feasting as well. May we be blessed. I invite you, Holy Spirit, to be our teacher so that even the children in our midst will be able to understand this morning what is your plan for us as your people as we head on to the trouble that is before us, but always remembering that the battle is the Lord's. Be with us this morning and bless us, we pray, for Christ's sake. Amen. Okay, so I, I suppose um, everybody have a look at this picture that is up and we see two women there. Uh, the woman Babylon, you see the dress, brethren? You see how the two of them are dressed differently? The woman of Revelation 12, the pure woman is clad from her head. She's well covered on her head. Her sleeves are long and her dress is long. But look at the difference in the woman Babylon. She is almost naked, no sleeves, short dress and her jewels. I pray that all the Vidya women will follow the woman of Revelation 12 and not this mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots and the way she dresses. Now, my topic this morning has to do with um, coming off of who will be part of this battle. Who is God going to engage in this battle? Is there any way that God told us where we can find the people who will be engaged in his work for these last days? And I want to read some extracts. Uh, when Sister Judith said 40 minutes. <laughs> uh, okay, so I have to say like Sister Ursula, um, what I can I'll say and what uh, the others will be left for another time. But I want to look at testimony to ministers and I'm going to be going through just some excerpt from page 112 to 115, just picking out some thoughts here. And the first one is on page 112, Testament to Ministers, and it says, Daniel and the Revelation must be studied as well as other prophecies of the Old and New Testament. There is much need of a much closer, sorry, there is need of a much closer study of the word of God especially should Daniel and the Revelation have attention as never before in the history of our work. To the bottom of that um, page, it says, read the book of Daniel, call up point by point, the history of the kingdoms they represented. The light that Daniel received from God was given especially for these last days. I'm on page 113. It says, in the past, teachers have declared Daniel and the Revelation to be a sealed book, and people have turned from them. The very name Revelation contradicts the statement that it is a sealed book. Revelation means that something of importance is revealed. The truth of this book are addressed to those living in these last days. 
I go over on page 114. It says, when the books of Daniel and the Revelation are better understood, believers will have an entirely different religious experience. They will be given such glimpses of the open gates of heaven that heart and mind will be impressed with the character that all must develop in order to realize the blessedness which is to be the reward of the pure in heart. And on page 115, it says, it was the lion of the tribe of Judah who unsealed the book and gave to John the revelation of what should be in these last days. The book of Daniel is unsealed in the revelation to John and carries us forward to the last scenes of this earth's history. Will all brethren bear in mind that we are living amid the perils of the last days? Read Revelation in connection with Daniel and teach these things. So we're gonna to go to the book of Daniel. I know everybody, almost everybody, if we have visitors on our line, we welcome you and we ask that God will make his word so plain to you that you will go away from this study this morning or this afternoon, whichever it is in your different vicinities, blessed by God. Now Daniel chapter two and Revelation chapter seven, are two books that actually carries the same lesson. And I'll point out that to us this morning. And I want to look for us to see where do we as God's people fit in this program that God, God has in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation. Now, Daniel chapter 2, 34 and 35, and brethren, um, as we have to, to move along fast, like Sister Ursula, because of time, and I would like to be asked questions, so I'll see how far I can get and I can stop. So anybody have any questions that they're not sure about or clear about, they can ask me. Okay, so Daniel 2, 34 and 35 talks about, Daniel 2, 35 says that um, the king saw a stone that was cut out without hands, which more the image upon its feet. Um, Brother, Brother Oliver, can you put that chart there for me, please? Daniel chapter two, right, thank you. Right, so we saw that the Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, all of us know the story, and then he saw a stone cut out. In verse 35, it didn't say where the stone came from, but Daniel 2.45 says that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. All of us know that the mountain symbolizes God's church. Now it says in Daniel 2.35 that the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, how did the stone become a mountain? In fact, how did we first get this kingdom? This stone being a kingdom, who will comprise it? I go to testimony to ministers, page 422. Testimony to ministers, 422. Remember Daniel 2, 45 says, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Daniel 2.45 says, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. Who will comprise this kingdom? I read testimony to ministers 4.22 and it reads, who are the subjects of God's kingdom is the question. All those who do his will, they have righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The members of Christ's kingdom are the sons of God partners in his great firm. The elect of God are a chosen generation, a peculiar people, a holy nation, to shew forth the presence of him who had called them out of darkness into his marvelous light. They are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. They are living stones, a royal priesthood. They are in co-partnership with Jesus Christ. These are they that follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth. So it says the subjects of God's kingdom are those who follow the lamb after saying all the other things, they are sons of God, partners with him. It says, these are they that follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth. Who are the people that follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth? All of us know, according to Revelation chapter um, 14, that it is the 140 and 4,000 who will follow the lamb. How do, do we get 144,000? How do they come about? 
we go to the book of Revelation. Revelation, remember that we read that Daniel and the Revelation must be studied together. How do you get 144,000? That Revelation chapter seven, verses one to four. Revelation seven, one to four, and I read in your hearing. And um, brother Oliver, can you put up the other chart with the four winds? So we want to know what we are finding out. Yes, the battle is the Lord's and who will the Lord hire to depart in this battle with him and for him. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So when Daniel says in Daniel 2 that they are cut without hands, because of course that is what is said in Daniel 2, that the stone was cut without hands out of the mountain, John calls it the seal. Daniel and the revelation giving us the same story. What else do these two books have in common? What else do Daniel 2 and Revelation 7 have in common? I have to read something for you first from the book, Testimony to Ministers, page 106. And it reads, the Bible must not be interpreted to suit the ideas of men, however long they may have held these ideas to be true. We are not to accept the opinion of commentators as the voice of God. They are erring mortals like ourselves. God has given reasoning power to us as well as to them. We should make the Bible its own expositor. That is saying that we are not to take man's explanation and interpretation on the word of God, except through his prophets, but we are to let the Bible as well explain itself. So we want to find out now where in Daniel and where in the Revelation God is going to get these people from. 144,000. Now, we already, I already cited that there was a stone cut out and all of us who are studying know that the stone from Isaiah chapter two and Zechariah chapter eight and um, Micah chapter four all tells us that the mountain in prophecy represents God's church and the stone represents a portion of God's church that God is going to cut without hands or seal. They are the 144,000. Now, what else does Daniel and the Revelation have in common? If we go to the book of Daniel verse 35, we'll see something there. Daniel 2, 35. Daniel 2, 35. And it says, okay, let me just, right. Daniel 2, 35 says, then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and gold broke into pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Daniel chapter 2.35 is saying the same thing that Revelation 7.1 says. Revelation 7.1 says, after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow. I hope everybody noticed that, that the angels are holding four winds, but when it is let loose, it will form the wind, one thing. What is the wind? What is the wind? The four winds will form the wind. What is the wind? I read from Testimony to Ministers, sorry, Testimony for the Church, Volume 5, page 152. What is the wind? 
and I'm tying my subject in, um, with Sister Ursula's, as we get ready for what is coming. Now, Testimony, Volume 5, 152 says, the time is coming when we cannot sell at any price. The decree will soon go forth prohibiting men to buy or sell of any man, save him that had the mark of the beast. We came near having this realization in California a short time since, but this was only the threatening of the blowing of the four winds. As yet, they are held by the four angels. We are not just ready. There is a work yet to be done. Then the angels will be bidden to let go that the four winds may blow upon the earth. This will be a decisive time for God's children, a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Now is our opportunity to work. So the four winds, in inspiration is saying, represents the mark of the beast. That's the one thing it will form, the mark of the beast. Now in Daniel chapter two, I'll be going from Daniel chapter two to Revelation chapter seven, because these two books uh, must tell us where we are and who is God getting ready to use in this battle that is his. So Revelation, Daniel chapter 2.35 says, um, when this, then was the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer treasure floor and the wind carried them away. So the wind carried away the image. We just found out that the wind is the mark of the beast. But then it says the wind carried away the chaff. Who is the chaff, brethren? Or who's represented by the chaff? We go to the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1. And let's see who's the chaff. Because the wind or the mark of the beast is going to take away the chaff. Who is the chaff? Psalm chapter 1. If somebody have it or know it, they can say it or they can read it. This is Sabbath school, Psalm chapter one. Blessed is the man. We don't have a minute to spare. Shepherd, I shall not want. You may have me to lie down no, in no, Sorry, that's not Psalm chapter one. Psalm chapter one is blessed is the man. Oh, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters, that bringeth of his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, but whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord will have the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Amen. So the Bible is telling us in Psalm, because testimony to ministers, page 106 says the Bible must be its own expositor. So here the Bible is telling us that the ungodly are the chaff, or like the chaff which the wind carried away. So all those who the mark of the beast will take away, brethren, is counted as chaff. And they are the ungodly. But God has a program. Daniel 2 tells us that the stone became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, Brother Oliver, can you put the charter back on Daniel 2 for me, please? Thanks. Now we, we, we march in Daniel 2 and Revelation chapter 7. Daniel chapter 2. I'm not seeing the chart. The Daniel chapter 2 chart. Right, thank you. Right. So here it says that when the stone smites the image, the stone became a great mountain. You know, in the, in the book, um, um, 2TG, number eight, page 27, Brother Hadif says, all we need is the key word. So brethren, I want to point out the key word from Revelation 7 and Daniel chapter two. Daniel chapter two says that the stone became 
when it's more the image, it became a great mountain. But what does Revelation 7 says? We go to Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9. And it says, after the ceiling of the 144,000, or, or the stone that is cut out, it says, after that, after this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man can number. So here, Daniel 2 and Revelation chapter 7 is giving the account of the same story. While Daniel says, the stone was cut out and it became a great mountain, Revelation says, after God seals the 144,000, there is a great multitude. So the two of them are giving us the same account. Now, if this is true, that the stone is God's people, the 144,000, and the stone is going to break up the image in Daniel chapter 2, then where is the people to form this, to make this stone grow into a mountain? Where is the people? Because we normally talk of the, the church and then we talk of the work of the stone, but then it says the stone became a great mountain. Where are the people? Can we find it in Daniel chapter? Can we find them in Daniel chapter two? Of course, let's search for them because the 144,000 has a work to do to bring God's people out of this image. And that is how it's going to crumble. Now, we are the people. We go to Daniel chapter two and we're going to read from verse 40 to 43. We are looking for the people to turn the stone into a mountain. Daniel chapter two. We're looking for the people and get your book and your pen, brethren, so that you'll be able to write. Daniel 2, and I'm going to read in your hearing from 41 to 43. And it says, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. It's divided between the iron and the potter's clay. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron. For whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, and as the feet and the toes are part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou, saw, thou sawest iron again mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And then verse 44 says, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Can anybody tell me how many clay they saw in this image? Now, remember, you only have 40 minutes, so you have to answer fast. Please, it's Sabbath school. Open your mic and tell me how many clays you saw in this image. Anybody? I just read Daniel 2, 40 to 43. How many clays are mentioned in this image? Two. Say it. Tell me what they are. Um, anybody wants to help? She is right that it is two, but she needs to name them for me. The feet and the toes. No, the clay. She, I asked how many kinds of clay is in this image, and the sister said two, and she is right. But I need you to name the clay for me. Nobody noticed? Sister Deborah, it's um, Porter's clay in 41. Yes. And miry clay in 43. Amen. Amen. So there are oh. two types of clay in this image. There's the potter's clay and there's the miry clay. So we want to see if there's a difference between the two. So we go to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 18. Where are the people that will come out to form this, to make this stone become a mountain, brethren? Jeremiah chapter 18. There are two clays in this image, the potter's clay. And note that it says in verse 41 that the potter's clay is not mixed with the iron, but the miry clay is mixed twice, God said. The miry clay is mixed with the iron. Now, who is the potter's clay? I read Jeremiah chapter 16, and I'm going to read from verse 1, and I'll come down. 
and it says, the word of God came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, arise, go down to the potter's house. There I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels and the vessel that was made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with thee as this potter, said the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. So the potter's clay is God's children. The potter's clay is God's people. And they are in the image. Now, who is the miry clay? Are they different? Let's find out. The miry clay. We go to the book of Ezekiel. We want to find out who is the miry clay. The book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 47. We're looking for the miry clay. Now, the potter's clay is God's children or God's people. Who's the miry clay? That is mixed with the iron. Remember, iron is Rome. And that is what Sister Phyllis, uh, I mean, Sister Ursula did this morning as to what is going to happen with the two horned beasts when they uh, implement the mark of the beast and then it goes on to the scarlet colored beast, then um, they will become the chaff. All those who take the mark of the beast will become the chaff. Are the chaff the, product, the miry clay? Let's find out. Ezekiel chapter 47, and I'll read um, for time. I'll read verse 11, because all of us know Ezekiel chapter 4 and 47 talks about the stream from the fountain and how when Ezekiel went into the water, it was to his, to his ankle first, then to his knees, then to his loins, and the water was so much that he could swim in it. And then there was the two banks of the river, and all of those have representation. But what does the miry represent? So Ezekiel 47 verse 11 says, but the miry places... You hear the word, Myri, but the Myri places thereof and the marshes thereof shall be given to, shall not be healed, they shall be given to salt. Let me read that again. But the Myri places thereof and the marshes thereof shall not be healed, they shall be given to salt. Now let's see how Brother Hadev explains this in the book 2SR, page 297. We are looking for the miry, who they represent. It says the miry places will be given to salt. And this is how inspiration explains it in the 2SR 297. I read the bottom paragraph. It says, but the miry places thereof and the marshes thereof shall, be, shall not be healed. They shall be given to salt. Ezekiel 47, 11. The marshes and the miry places represent denominations and sects separate of the mighty river and that they shall not be saved nor healed, turned to salt, meaning eternally lost as was Lot's wife. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the son of man, likewise also like it was in the days of Lot, remember Lot's wife. Luke 17, 26, 28, and 32. So those that are given to salt is the miry, and the miry will be lost. So brethren, the miry, those who receive the mark of the beast, or those who the wind carry away as shaft, all of them will be the unsaved and the lost. But out of this image will come the potter's clay, God's children. So brethren, we have a work to do. And Isaiah 66 tells us that. And I was, after the purification, Isaiah 66, he says, and I will send those that escape unto the nation and ye shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all nations in chariots and in litters and upon swift bill. So you, we have to go and bring our brethren, those represented by the potter's clay. And that is how the stone will become a great mountain. God has to call his people out. And I want to read um, something from the book, Christian Service, and I read on page 22. Christian Service, page 22. And it says, 
hearts that respond to the influence of the Holy Spirit are channels through which God's blessings flows. Were those who serve God removed from the earth and his spirit withdrawn from men, this world will be left to desolation and destruction, the fruit of Satan's dominion. Though the wicked know it not, they owe even the blessing of this life to the present. Sorry, let me read that over. Though the wicked know it not, they owe even the blessing of blessings of this life to the presence in the world of God's people whom they despise and oppress. So you hear what inspiration says? That if God's people should be taken out of this world, it will crumble. And we saw that in the antediluvian time when God took out Lot and his, I mean Noah and his family and put them into the ark. The world was flooded and the others were drowned. When God called Lot out of Sodom, the place went up in fire. So it is the righteous that keeps this world in standing. And so brethren, we should give thanks this morning that we are one of those persons. We are the salt of the earth. We are the people who God is counting on. And even though the world don't like us, it, like us, it is because of us that the world is still standing. We, we, anybody can say amen to that, that God has a people um, and what it says, I think it is in the book, Prophets and Kings, that God has never been without true representative upon this earth who have made his cause their own. So brethren, God is counting on you and I to be part of this. And it is because of the righteous that the wicked walk about and live. So we see that when God calls his people out of this system, the whole system is going to crumble. It is God's people that is keeping this image standing. So brethren, get ready to work for God. There is trouble coming, but God is counting on the stone. He has to get the stone or he has to get a steel company, 144,000 of us whom he can engage in his army. The battle is the Lord in Joel chapter two. A great people and a strong, the world has never seen anybody like us. Brethren, are we getting ready? Or are we doing ourselves like the woman Babylon, the way she dresses? The, the doctrines that she have and all the other things that is wrong, or are we going with the woman of Revelation chapter 12, which is the pure woman dressed from her head to her feet, clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, God's true church, God's true people. So here we see at a quick glance that God has, there is two clays in the image of Daniel 2, two sets of people, and one set will form the other mountain that God is about to, to, to set up. It says Isaiah chapter two, Micah chapter four is telling us that when God's mountain is established in the top of the mountain and exalted above the hills, all nations will flow on it. All God's people will come out, brethren. The call will be made, come out of her, my people. Now, um, Sister Ursula touched on Revelation chapter 17, and I want to go back there to point out something as well. Revelation chapter 17 is pointing, remember the books of Daniel and the Revelation are to be studied together. So it's a whole um, program that is going down, brethren, and God is looking for some honest people. I know sometimes, um, even here in Barbados, I heard already where a soldier shot another soldier. But the purpose for our army is not for soldiers to be shooting soldiers. Soldiers are to protect their country and guard each other, have each other back. If one is injured, the one is to pick up the other one and go with it, not to fight the other one, not to turn your weapons on each other. And I pray God that we won't do that as we try to engage in God's army, that we don't turn our weapons on each other, but all the weapons of our warfare are not carnal brethren, but mighty true God to the pulling down of strongholds. So let us bring down the strongholds brethren of the enemy and see if we can rescue our Amis and Roma, Amis, our brothers and our sisters in mother. They need to know what we know because God is looking for 144,000 of us and all of us have to come from the Seventh-day Adventist church. So brethren, we need to get up our work. The world is waiting on us, they are ready we have to get ready as well and stay ready, not backsliding, sinning and confessing, sinning and confessing, 
but see if by God's grace, we can truly become overcomers by studying his word, which um, I would say to those who I study with, the word of God is your medication. You know, when you go to the doctor, the doctor will say, take one of this three times a day or half of this two times a day. So we need to do with the word of God because it is the only thing that will cleanse us. In Ephesians, he said that he might sanctify and cleanse us with the washing of water by the word. So if we take our medication, brethren, we will get healed. Because we go to the doctor, we don't even know what the medication has in it, but we put it in our mouths and we drink it anyhow, not even knowing what it is. And some of it is surely poisoned. That's why they ask us to stay away from the pharmaceuticals and see how you can use natural things as much as possible. But sometimes those pharmaceuticals is needed, especially when you get in an accident and all that, you need antibiotics to kill the bacteria in your body and so on. Or the, what, the bacteria, not virus, the bacteria. So it has its place. So brethren, for us, we need to take God's word. And don't worry if you're not changing. You take the word of God and it's gonna change you. But you gotta take your medication regularly. So if you can take it three times a day, it's good. But don't take it less than two. But if you take it once, okay. But try to up it. Try to eat more. Try to study more. So that the word of God can do the work that God has promised to do for us. Now, now I go to Revelation chapter 17. And I want to point out something there to us again, brethren. Now, Revelation 17 is talking about a woman. John said he saw this woman decked. And he himself admired the woman the way the woman was dressed up. And then um, Revelation 17, verse three says, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and 10 horns. Brother Oliver, you can put back the picture, please. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls and having a golden cup in her hands, in her hand full of the abomination and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her head was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abomination of the earth. Now, Revelation um, 17 is telling us about this woman. But when we go over to Revelation chapter 18, it says something here. Sister, you have five minutes. Pardon? You have five minutes. Five minutes? Okay. Okay, so let me just read this part. It says, um, and he cried with a, uh, Revelation 18, 3 says, for all nations have drunken of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And I'll, I'll jump down to verse 4, and it says, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Where is God's people in this woman? Because the Bible only talks about this woman sitting with a cup in her hand and decked with gold. And still God is calling his people out of her. Where are the people? Um, Brother Oliver, can you put up the one with the high priest? Where is God's people? Now, Exodus chapter 28, and you can write, brethren, I'll just read, um, just write your verse. Where is God's people in this woman? Because God is saying, come out of her, my people. Where are the people? Exodus chapter, Exodus chapter 28. Where is the people? Exodus chapter 28, and I'll read. Brethren, you can read the rest from verse 15 in your own time. Um, this is how the priest is dressed. But where are the people? Verse 12 says, um, well, in Revelation, I mean, sorry, in Exodus chapter 28, it speaks about the stones, the different stones, 12 stones. And verse 21 says, and the stone shall be with the names of the children of Israel, 12 according to their names, like the engraving of a signet. Everyone with his name shall be according to the 12 tribes. So look on this um, high priest. This is how Jesus is dressed or something similar in the heavenly sanctuary. And brethren, he's carrying the 12 tribes. He's carrying God, his children on his breast. So we are not forgotten. So even sometimes when we feel that nobody cares about us, we are not forgotten. Jesus is taking us around as he moves around in the sanctuary in heaven. We are on his chest. Those 12 stones represent the children of Israel, the 12 tribes. And 
In Revelation chapter 18, it says, come out of her, my people. Where's the woman? The Bible says that the woman had in her hand a cup and she was decked with the precious stones. How the stones became precious? Now you can take the text, brethren. Um, 1 Peter 2, 6 and 7, the stone becomes precious because of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. All those who who's covered by the blood of Jesus becomes Jesus's precious stone. His children, they are the potter's clay. So in Daniel, in the image, they are the potter's clay. And in the woman, they are the precious stones. We are God's precious children. And God is getting 144,000 of us from the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Then he's going to send us to work, brethren, to bring the great multitude out of the nation, his precious stone, his children, because he says, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her place. Brethren, God is counting on you and I to save the world, to save the nation, be part of this battle, be part of this army. And when his kingdom come and we see people coming in and rejoicing to be able to bow at the feet and to cast our crowns down at the feet of our alpha and our omega, our beginning and our end, all of us will be blessed and be happy. Brethren, there's more to say, but I'll stop here because um, I just want to point out that God is counting on us 144,000 to go to work according to Great Controversy 611. It says, uh, 612, Ellen White says, servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration shall hasten from place to place to carry this message. By thousands of voices all over the world, the warning will be given. Signs and wonders will follow the believers. And notwithstanding all the trouble that will come, just putting it in my word, a large number will take this stand on the side of God. Brethren, get ready and stay ready. God bless you. Thank you. Amen, Sister Debbie. And thank you also, Sister Ursula and uh, Sister Debbie for the lesson study that we have. So, brethren, I know you're um, full of the information in your brain. So let's have, let's take a break. Uh, what was it for uh, 10 to 15 minutes and we'll come back. But before you go, let us pray with uh, Brother Denko. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lovely Sabbath day. We thank you for the gathering that we have online. We have people from nearly 40, 50 countries, and we're grateful. They are not just persons, they are our brethren whom we love very, very dearly. And we're all striving with the power that you have given us to be among the faithful 144,000 sealed in your beloved Seventh-day Adventist Church. So help us to keep striving with all the power you've given us to be among the 144,000. We thank you for these prophecies because as Peter says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto we do well that we take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in our hearts. So bless all our brothers and sisters in line and bless us here and may we strive day by day to become more like Jesus, that we shall be sealed among his faithful people. Continue to bless us and be with us as we keep the Sabbath holy. Even our visiting friends, we ask a special blessing for them in Jesus' holy name. Words of our mouth, meditation. Acceptable, thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So we'll take a 10 minutes break.